Middle Game Masterclass, Part 7, Nimzovich and his Theory of Blockade. Our first game is Nimzovich versus Salve. This is from Carlsbad, Carlo Vivari, 1911, in the Czech Republic, what is known today as the Czech Republic. We have E4 from the great Aaron Nimzovich. Nimzovich's theories were espoused in his books. My System especially, probably one of the most famous chess books in history. He talks about using the central squares as key outposts for the pieces. So I've ordered the chapters in our middle game class to be closely related. We just talked about outposts, and now we're going to talk about Nimzovich's theory of blockade. These are closely related concepts. So e4, e6, and Nimsovich liked to play the advanced variation against the French with d4, d5, and e5, releasing the tension. This is establishing a strong point for white on the e5 square. This is also what Nimsovich would describe as the head of the pawn chain. White's stronger side of the board being the king side, black usually having more space on the queen side after the following break, c5. Black attacks the pawn chain as close as he can to the base of the pawn chain. It would be possible to play the move f6. For example, this right away. But this move attacking the head of the pawn chain Criticized by Nimsovich as weakening the king, which is obviously true. The king on e8, h5, this diagonal access to the queen, if, uh, if nothing else is possible. So I really, really believe that f6 is a mistake on several levels. First of all, although you're attacking the white pawn center, which is natural, trying to destroy it, in this case you'd be going the wrong way, weakening your own king. But perhaps more importantly, trying to attack white at his strongest point. Basically his strong point on e5, a square he can control and have access to very easily. So one of Nimzovich's most important principles was that the pawn chain should be attacked at the base. So if you're trying to tear down a building, you would destroy it at the base, not from the top. So black is trying to tear down white's structure here. White supports it with c3. We'll see that Nimzovich has other ideas. In another game, he'll play knight f3. In this game, he played c3. But I should mention, Nimzovich actually experimented with a lot of interesting possibilities, including even queen g4. This is an extremely aggressive move. But based in principle on the fact that white has a space advantage because of that strong point on e5, black doesn't have access to the natural knight f6. I'm not espousing this move as necessarily good for white, but it's interesting and made possible by the space advantage that white has gained with e5. If c takes d, white could blockade. This is what we're talking about here, blockade with bishop d3 in this position. So that's an interesting possibility. Knight f3, another move just developing. The queen is out here exposed but very very aggressively placed on g4. So another interesting idea. But Nimsovich played c3 against Salvi in this original game. 1911. So Nimsovich facing knight c6, knight f3, and now queen b6. We'll take a look at another game where black actually attacks the head of the pawn chain a little bit later in this video. So queen b6, this is probably black's best move, fundamentally attacking the center here. Bishop d3, and we could see what is now known as a modern day gambit. If white were to castle here, we would reach the Milner-Barry variation. Castles, totally different methodology than Nimsovich. In this variation, White is reliant on his development advantage. Knight takes d4, queen takes d4. Knight c3, queen takes e5. The Milner-Barry. 
But Nimsovich, not trying to play for development and attack and tactics, he's playing a positional game in closed positions, usually for blockade and strategic aims. So this Milner Barry would be a different, much different style than Nimsovich usually played. Queen b6, bishop d3, bishop d7, and now d takes c5. This goes against what were called classical principles. White would maintain the center at all costs, clinging to those, those pawns on d4 and e5, using them as a shield. Nimzovich actually gives up his center pawn in order to later use the d4 square for his pieces. This, this is basically the beginning of the strategy of blockade. Watch what happens here. Bishop takes c5, and now castles. White had to defend the f2 point. Now black really must play a5 in this position, as modern games have actually come to show. But instead, Salve, not really sensing the danger, tries to break the center with a dangerous move f6. And we talked about this, the possibility that Black weakens his king, and he tries to attack white at the strong point, e5. We see very clearly in this game the principle of blockade, b4, and now bishop e7, bishop f4. Clearly white has a backward pawn along the c-file, but Nimsovich is thinking a little bit deeper. He's basically banking on the fact that black is not going to be able to exploit that. F takes e5, knight takes e5, knight takes e5, and bishop takes e5. And this is going to bring us back to a familiar theme from an early point in the middle game series. We're looking at hanging pawns. We've got hanging pawns for black on e6 and d5. But the hanging pawns are best when they're actually next to each other, when they're fluid and not fixed. In this case, not only are they not fluid, but they're physically fixed by a point at e5 occupied by a bishop. Also the point at d4, very relevant. These two squares that Nimzovich now has very good control of, d4 and e5, establishing the blockade, in this case against the hanging pawns. Knight f6, knight to d2, castles, and knight f3, reinforcing control of these vital blockading squares. And in this position, black has serious disadvantage due to this lack of control of those central squares. The fact that his pawns cannot move. Bishop d6 and this exchange, although it frees black a little bit, basically trades black's good bishop for white's quote unquote bad bishop, the dark square bishop. White's more active bishop is allowed to roam free here, pursue attacking chances against the black king. But Nimsevich's main principle is to maintain very strong control over these key blockading squares, the e5 and the d4. Queen e2, rook c8. I was talking about the backward pawn earlier. This pawn, protected by this move, bishop d4. Black, I suppose, expected an exchange of bishops here. But Nimsovich realized that he has the ideal situation. He can actually attack a7, avoid the exchange of black's bishop by getting huge control of e5 here. So this bad bishop remains on d4, and it's blockading the black center as well as protecting the pawn on c3. Queen c7, and now knight e5 occupying the other square. So now white has full control of the blockading squares, e5 and d4. This is essentially what we're aiming for when we use Nimzovich's theory of blockade. We want to fix the opponent's pawns, create outpost squares for our pieces, and use that to our advantage to build a space advantage, and eventually a decisive attack. Black now bishop e8. This typical French bishop, obviously very restricted, rook e1, and now black makes a very serious decision here. Bishop takes e5, trading off his good bishop. Bishop takes e5, queen c6, bishop d4 attacking, 
the backward pawn. You see what a massive advantage white has now with two bishops raking the king's side. Nimzovich was able to pursue a decisive attack on the black king. Again, this was Nimzovich versus Salvi. At this point, it's very clear white has a huge advantage. Bishop d7, queen c2, rook f7, rook e3. The space that white has, that, that afforded really afforded white by the immobility of black's pawns at d5 D and e6. He's able to build a very strong attack. b6, rook g3, king h8, and a win of material with bishop takes h7. Beautiful attacking play. I recommend you take a look at the whole game. Now we're going to go back to a slightly different example. We're going to take a look at another game from the same French advanced variation, but in this case, a slightly different continuation that I alluded to earlier. Knight c6, knight f3, f6. This is another great game, Nimsovich versus Levin Fish. This is from the same tournament as the first game, Carlsbad 1911. Nimsovich really at the peak of his powers, as saying his blockade strategies, befuddling the world. Until that point, really, most players had adhered to a pure classical idea of the center, that the central pawn should just be maintained. Watch what happens here. Nimsovich actually goes out of his way with his good bishop, bishop b5. This would have been heresy to classical players to trade off the good bishop potentially traded off. And black plays bishop d7. This is about controlling the e5 square. And here there are some tricks. White castles. Now it should be noted that if we take knight takes e5 in this position, bishop takes d7 check, knight takes d7, black wins a pawn. But after knight takes e5, White has a strong attack after knight takes e5 in this position. And this is the point because we have lots of good stuff based on queen h5 check in these variations. So life wasn't so easy for black. In the actual game, after castles he played queen b6. But I think it's regrettable for black to have played the move f6, trying to attack white at the strong point of his position essentially a mistake, also weakening the king. Nimzovich simply gives up the bishop on c6. Again, the classical masters would have been just astonished or were astonished by this. b takes c6. Notice how this bishop on, on d7 actually becomes quite a bad piece. And now e takes f6, actually giving up that very famous and powerful pawn on e5. White's essential space advantage. Nimzovich just gives it up. And now probably black should take back with a pawn to keep control of the e5 square. But again, this is not a classical style move. Levenfish takes back with a knight on f6. And now knight e5. There's the outpost square again. Essential Nimzovich blockade strategy. Black's bishops, this one is actually only a defensive piece. And the other one, at best, can challenge the e5 square. At best, could equal that knight on e5. Bishop d6. And then, again, astonishing the masters, the classical players, giving up the other point on d4. Seemingly giving up his center, but knowing that he has control. The squares, the control of the squares. That's what we're talking about here absolute control of d4. White is not actually losing control of d4. He's not lessening his control of d4 by trading the pawn off. He still physically has the same amount of control. This pawn is attacking d4. The queen is attacking d4. So by trading off that pawn, we're not giving up our control of that square. We're opening up the possibility to use that square as an outpost for our pieces. Bishop takes c5, and then a very aggressive plan, bishop g5. Obviously, this is a sacrifice. But if black takes that pawn, he succumbs to a very strong attack based on bishop takes f6. For example, queen takes b2, 
would be very dangerous because a bishop takes f6 and then queen h5 again is on the way with massive threats for white. So probably Levenfish played the best move here. Queen back to d8. Bishop takes f6. Here I see again. Nimsovich showing no respect that the bishops should be stronger than the knights. Perhaps Mikhail Chigorin, another lover of knights, appreciated this game. Bishop takes f6, queen takes f6, queen h5 check, g6, and now queen e2. White just subtly inducing some weaknesses on the dark squares in black's position with the sneaky move queen h5. Rook d8, defending the d7 bishop, knight d2. And these knights are every bit as strong or stronger than the opponent's bishops. Knights rely heavily on outpost squares. And we have two key outpost squares on e5 and d4. The knights are better than the bishops. And another factor that's often kind of underrated, that two knights often coordinate much better than two bishops. Something that, again, we can look back even further to Chigorin's games. I think Chigorin actually very closely related as a player stylistically to Nimsovich. Castles, rook on a to e1. Over protection. We see this even later. We see this 50 years later in Petrosian's games. Over protection of the strong point. Very fundamental. And now black is tied down. We don't want the rook blocked by its own pawn. We don't want pieces to have to defend pawns. But that is the case here. Black giving up his active rook on the f file. King h1, bishop d6, f4. Black tries to free himself. And then again, a classic Nimzovich ploy, the blockade. Locking the pawns. This is an essential concept in blockade strategy. The locking of the pawns to favor the knights. Block the position. The bishops don't do well with blocked pawn structures. White achieved a clear advantage here. After bishop f8, c takes d5. He cannot recapture on d5 because of the tactic knight takes d7. It was actually a sly sacrifice by Levenfish. Bishop c8, and now knight e4, queen g7. And Nimsovich himself, in his own notes, I think, later was unhappy with his play consequently. He took on e6 in this position. But he felt that by taking on e6, he gave black play. He gave the two bishops chances. He played brilliantly in the rest of this game. But I think that the truth is he should have played d6 here. It's very possible this move is even stronger, giving the pawn back to maintain the ideal blockade position. But he went on to win anyway. But a fantastic position has been achieved here. The knights just absolutely outposted. And after d6, this would be the key position where the knights are just much stronger than the bishops. Black's pawn structure, worse than white's. He has four pawn islands to white's two. Massive advantage to white. Our next example is back here at our starting position in the advanced French. We're going to look at a move instead of c3, knight f3. Other moves are possible. As I said, queen g4 is an interesting try. Even d takes c5, a possible line. Nimzovichian style. So Nimsovich played instead in this game knight f3. The idea being, if black plays pawn takes pawn on d4, c takes d4, we could play a gambit variation that's popular even today, bishop d3. The idea being that this pawn on d4 is not going anywhere. We could slowly surround it while making use of his attacking chances on the king side based on the spatial advantage of e5. In the game black played knight c6, and we enter into a different type of game. White doesn't maintain the structure with c3. He plays d takes c5, bishop takes c5, and develops quickly with bishop d3. Now black should 
meet this as well with quick development. Something like knight on g to e7 in this position, I believe. But the opponent here, Anderson, this was played much later, 22 years later in Aarhus in 1933. Nimsovich versus Anderson. Knight b4. And this move right here, I think, is a classic mistake playing into Nimzovich's hands. So notice that Nimzovich is a player who loves to control the d4 square, the e5 square. And now he's been willing to give up his white square bishop on b5 in the previous game for the knight on c6. This is just another way of that happening, a different way of that bishop giving itself up for the knight on c6. Nimzovich will get good control of d4 and e5 again, the knight giving up control of those key squares by going to b4. So it's a tempting move, but I don't think it's a good move for black. Castles, knight takes d3, recapturing with the pawn. It's obviously possible to take with the queen, but the pawn is useful. Knight e7, now knight on bd2. This move particularly heading for b3, and particularly heading for the outpost square at d4. Castles, very logical play by white. Again, knight b3, bishop b6, bishop g5. All about controlling the center. And in this case, again, the two knights will be more functional than the two bishops in the lock structure that we have here. Symmetrical structures, lock structures, and structures without breaks are positions that favor the knights rather than the bishops. Bishop d7. Bishops like asymmetrical structures, open positions. This is not going to happen here. Nimsovich has him in a pin. He plays queen d2, not neglecting his development either. Rook c8, queen b4, a very ugly pin. Rook e8, and now rook on a to c1. Bishop c6, already these two bishops looking kind of awkward. The one on c6 particularly blocked in by its own pawns not coordinating with the other pieces. Notice white's excellent control of the d4 outpost in this position. Both knights and the queen. The queen with great lateral mobility. And now the blockading move, knight on f to d4, queen d7. The pin is broken and bishop takes e7. And we get like a model endgame for white. Queen takes e7, queen takes e7. Black is cramped, so he should actually be happy to trade. But the end game, after knight takes c6, b takes c6, and the pawn move, which is handy by the way, d4, that recapture with the pawn, c takes d, makes a big difference now, the pawn able to influence the center. Rook on e to c7, and knight c5. And this is going into outside our realm. This is end game land now. I'm going to break it off here, but you see the blockade strategy again, the c5 square. So in this case, in this particular example, it wasn't really d4 and e5. It was actually d4 and c5. The other support point of the d4 outpost, the c5 outpost, and Nimsovich went on to win a very, very nice Rubenstein-like endgame, in fact, in this game from 1933. Now I thought we'd continue with one game outside in a different opening, e4, e5. What would Nimsovich do here in the classical openings? We have an interesting game and a famous game, again from his early career. This was played in 1910, very early in the career, against another strong player, the tactician Rudolf Spielmann. So e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, scotch game. This was a favorite of Nimsovich. It does create open positions. A little bit different from his strategy against the French. Honestly, I would think that, that Nimsovich would have been quite good at playing the, the Spanish or Roy Lopez. e takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight to c3. And... Modern theory favors knight takes c6, but the opening is another story. 
knight to c3, bishop to b4. This is a variation that's considered to be more or less equal. And I don't think that Nimzovich necessarily gets anything special out of the opening. But we see his strategy at work again. Knight takes c6, b takes c6, bishop d3. This is a main line. And Spielman plays correctly here. d5, e takes d5, c takes d5, castles, castles. And now bishop g5. This variation played even today at the highest levels. Again, not really a fashionable variation in modern chess, but it's considered to be more or less equal, correct play for both sides. But once again, we see Nimzovich with the superior pawn structure. Here, the hanging pawns for black, alluding to an early chapter in our middle game series. Pawns at c7 and d5. Black plays c6, protecting the d5 pawn. And now I believe that theory here for white is possibly queen f3. Nimzovich's move is interesting as well, knight e2. But it's a little bit passive for white, admittedly. But this knight is not doing anything on c3. It had nowhere to go. It's kind of boxed out, so it maneuvers to the king side. Spielman starts to get some active play in this game, and he may have even been slightly better at some point. Knight d4, an outpost square. But black has to be careful about this base of his hanging pawns. Queen d6, queen f3, and then knight e4. Black begins to get some activity. So he actually pushed Nimzovich back. The later part of the game, though, here is more interesting. The position was murky and complicated. Bishop e3, bishop d7, rook d1. No weaknesses, but play against the hanging pawns. And you're going to see the blockade strategy coming to play more gradually in this case. Spielman with some serious threats. Now queen g6 on the king's side. This is an attacking player and a dangerous one. White plays h3. Now bishop d6. Both bishops aiming at Nimzovich's king's side. He played bishop back to c1. Guarding the b2 pawn. Rook e7. And now the key moment begins. c4. Playing against the hanging pawns, but also undermining those pawns and actually eventually blockading these pawns. So unknowingly, unwittingly, Spielman actually plays into a structure that favors white. c5, knight e2, and d4. Black has a space advantage. Black has attacking chances here. But Nimzovich understands that he's fixed this dangerous pawn on d4. He's immobilized it. He can break with b4 at some point. And in some situations, it could become a weakness, the structure. And you'll see what happens here is kind of amazing. Not a long game, believe it or not. Bishop f4 trading off this dangerous piece. Bishop c6, knight g3, some tactics here. Bishop takes f4, queen takes f4, knight takes g3. And this is practically an end game more than a middle game, but I wanted to share this last example with everyone. F takes g3. Black has the initiative with the open e file, but white has some attacking chances down the f file. Queen e6. And then the most amazing transition happens here. It looks like black is better. He has a protected pass pawn that could be very dangerous. But this is double edged sword because the pawn is immobilized. The ideal blockader would be a knight, but the bishop on d3 is still a good blockader. White actually gets a winning position here with the move queen f5. And I'm sure that black, in this case, Spielman, must have been just shaking his head, thinking, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong, you know, to lose this game? And the answer is the blockade. The blockade proved that these pawns ultimately were immobilized and became weak. White has a double threat against h7 and a threat against c5 and if you trade queens on f5 rook takes f5 and the pawn will simply fall on c5 there's no way to defend it white went on to win very easily spielman avoided trading queens to keep his practical chances alive because after queen takes queen rook takes he's going to just lose the c5 pawn in an end game 
So he tries to keep pieces on, but it's a very quick victory, ironically. Weaknesses are created by g6, and he blundered very quickly. King h2, queen d7, and then a beautiful move, rook f4. Look how Nimzovich has just brought everything to bear against that pawn on d4. He blockaded and then sieged the now isolated, which was formerly hanging pawns on d4. Brilliant play. He was somewhat lucky here. Black blundered. Rook e6, allowing the flashy combination bishop takes g6 with the massive threat of rook takes d4, pulverizing the queen and rook along the d-file. Black desperately tried rook e2, bishop takes f7 check, king g7, and queen g5, and it was over. Bit of attacking play, but really Nimzovich's entire game was based on structure and strategy and trying to fix and blockade Black's mobile hanging pawns. We've seen some excellent examples of Nimzovich and the strategy of blockade.